Darshan Kulkarni, welcome. Thank you, sir. I'm excited to be here. I get to talk to the guru, the clinical trials guru in plain English. So I'm excited. Man, in plain English, like we're working on Spanish with Latinos in clinical research. We actually, I jump on a few in Spanish. Um, uh, do you speak Spanish? Yeah. Well, I didn't know claro, that. Claro que sí, más o menos. Uh, se habla español. That's the only thing I know. Yeah, man. I mean, I live in a border town now. Like, my Spanish levels exponentially skyrocketed. Like, wow. Since we moved here. I, I knew it, like, uh, enough to, like, get by. But now I could actually have a conversation. Not an intelligent one, I don't think, but still a conversation. I mean, what does not an intelligent one mean? And the reason I asked is... Depth. We can't go in depth. And then... Conversational. Conversational. And then... Humor and slang are the toughest parts to master. Once you get those, like you're basically fluent. So I'm not there yet. I'm not, I'm almost at the humor part, and then some slang. How many languages do you speak? English, Spanish, Romanian. I took French in high school, but never paid attention, so it doesn't <laughs> doesn't count. Somehow I got a passing grade. Four years of high school, and I that's that's pretty can't good. Really speak French, but yeah. Je ne comprends pas. Ah, man. See, I can't I can't really reply back. I mean, either. Any <laughs> response you gave to me would be limited. <laughs> but anyways, man, the song... It goes to diversity. goes to the topic for today. The topic for today, you commented on a post I put recently about... It's nice that uh, Pharma says the right stuff. Yeah, especially big pharma. I feel like small biotechs can take more risks. I feel like this is their competitive advantage, maybe. But when the FDA mandates more diversity in trials, which we can argue, like, I mean, they've done it, but have they actually told, have they actually not approved a study with good results yet because of a lack of diversity? That I'm not sure about. So it's interesting you ask this question. Um, I'm actually right in the middle of like writing an article. Hopefully, it'll get published soon. I'm talking to some people right now. Of course, you are. you're always, you're the industry's hardest working man. Says says Mr. Dan Safera. I I consider that to be high praise. <laughs> uh, um, I I'm working on an article on diversity and the history of diversity, and we actually the, like the first thing I was able to find that I looked at that was reasonable was sort of the 1988 guideline for the format and content of clinical and statistical sections um, of new drug applications. And there they actually asked for demographic information. Mm -hmm. So the point is demographics became something people cared about starting in the 1980s. And then we, we've had a few different things like the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993 and FADAMA, which talked about uh, diversity as well. So we've had this, this idea of, we want more diversity, but um, I, I think this is the first sort of solid attempt around it. That's around saying it is required. Sponsored, right? Because that NIH stuff, I mean, that's more like academic. Who's going to get a grant? Like people like <laughs> Eli Lilly and Takeda don't care about that. <laughs> um, it was for NIH funded studies in that specific right. instance. Right. Yeah. But, this is but again, you have to remember, it's like the common rule, right? Some of the stuff just sort of translates in and filters down and trickles down True. in the future. It only took four decades. <laughs> it's 2023. Ah. You said 80s and 90s. Now it's yeah. what 2024. It's yeah. going to be where we're talking about, you know, virtual reality, and we still can't get patients in a study. We still can't get a Spanish language consent form on a iPad. Yeah. So. Well, <laughs> we're gonna have a whole discussion about that as well. I'm not sure that's necessarily true, but you need to have the right structures and the right controls in place. But okay. I wanted to have a like a higher level discussion because what I posted was, and I just had it before I went live. Farm big pharma is more risk averse than they are motivated to get pay, to get diverse patients in their trials. Now the two are going to collide because it's just going to be a matter of time when the FDA reviews a study, a phase three study, a big one. Mm -hmm. And says, hey, these results were great, but unfortunately, you, you were lacking on the diversity, so we can't approve it. That's going to 
catalyze. Like, this is nice now. A lot of virtue signaling. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's, you know, roast marshmallows by the fire and discuss the verse <laughs> quality. But that's going to make real change. And then so the I- whole CT world's trying to say, okay, well, let's get physicians in these communities to share. And my whole strategy is, no, let's get these clinicians to do the studies. Yeah. What are you so, like, so my, my, I have I have a few different responses to that. So number one, I um, I agree with Karina that this is a great topic. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Shout out to Karina. Love Karina. Um, but I, what I would I would start off with is agreeing with you that I think industry is rife. Every two years or so, you see a new buzzword, and that new buzzword is what everyone latches on to. Um, probably about ten years ago, that buzzword was patient centricity. Then the next buzzword was re- uh, remote studies. Then risk it was based. remember risk based. You and risk I did based. all there you go centralized podcast. monitoring. Yeah, uh, risk based, uh, uh, decentralized studies, um, and diversity. I mean, the thing is, <laughs> in the end, these are all to me. I, I think of it more like a diamond, where it's just what what facet are you showing? How is diversity not patient centric? How how are you in the end? You're trying to say that we want all types of patients in these studies. Well, yeah, because your studies should have that. I'm not sure why that's an, a novel idea. So to me, I'm agreeing with you that I think it's a, it's a lot of sort of fancy talk for, um, for what should have been happening in the first place. Um, and I, I think it, it reminds me of some of the stuff that uh, Brad Hightower has been doing, where he's been showing... These nonprofits that pop up, they make a bunch of money, and um, it's it's been about a, a fancy new topic, but the actual crux of it is mm. something that sites have been doing the whole time, yeah. um, and and maybe sponsors, maybe sponsors have been doing the whole time as well. They've just never quite focused on it. It's it's really making this. We want to consider this and be intentional about what we're doing. And I think that's what the FDA is looking for. Don't make it a byproduct. Don't make it a, a sideshow. Don't make it a, um, I'm surprised that happened. Make it a goal. And, and that's in line with what the FDA has been doing overall from a regulatory stra- uh, strategy perspective, which is if you, if you define where you're going, if you define your key goals, you're more likely to hit them. So if diversity is a key goal, you're more likely to hit it. Well, yeah. and. Like I said, it's only going to take one sponsor for, for the FDA to say, well, good results, but you know what? Unfortunately, like you're lacking on diversity and we can't approve it. Do another phase three. So and, the funny thing was there was yeah. a ver- there was a uh, reverse version of this in the past. I, I'd heard about it. I don't know exactly which study this was, but I'd heard about it where it was like a study done in China or in India or something like that, where there were too many people from that country. And they said that, how is this representative of patients in the U.S.? So you did all these studies with all these patients globally, but tell me it represents the people in the U.S. Mm. And that so was they probably only had to like They probably only had like three sites in the U.S. and they were AMCs and they didn't enroll Possibly. anyone. And yeah, yeah, I mean, we know that. So, yes, I agree. There are elements of all this stuff we discussed, DCT, risk-based monitoring that are here to stay. Yeah, but it, the dirty thing about our industry is there's a bunch of grifters in the way with their hands out for any new topic. Yeah, now it's diversity. Oh, give me, give me, give me. You know, that's like we're gonna oh, get. I, I think diversity is not even the hottest one right now. That was so two weeks ago. What's, a- what's AI the is the hottest one. Nah, uh, and- yeah, but AI is gonna <laughs> be AI is gonna be a fundamental like paradigm shift for everything. Yeah. I, I just, I, to me, I think it's going to be like everything else. It's just another tool. Right. Di- AI is going to play a huge role in diversity. Um, it's well, just, go ahead. You disagree? No. I think AI is going to affect everything it touches eventually. But wouldn't diversity affect everything we touch as well? Yeah, but I think of diversity is more pragmatic to reach the outcomes now than AI. How do you mean? I, so all you need. For diversity, like to increase more patients of a of a particular minority background into a study, is find sites in those areas where those patients are. Like, and you don't need to leave the U.S. So until I came to Yuma, right? They didn't have a site in Yuma. They're oh, is that right? Sponsored. 
Yeah, the only one here was hospital. They did oncology studies. Well, now they keep coming back to us, big pharma, because we have Hispanic. They're like, wait a minute, research naive and Hispanic? And someone actually took the time to train PIs how to do it, and now they have an infrastructure. Okay, now it makes sense. Like, of course we need a site there. Right. But it didn't make sense three years ago. So we just got to empower these communities. And the DCT answer to this is, well, let's make these clinics referring sites and then let's make a central site with a central PI. And yes, that is a strategy. I just don't, I, I see how that road ends and it doesn't end with that referring site actually doing anything because I know how busy these sites are. I'm curious from practical level what you think about that because I've been with sites that have done the whole central PI versus referring sites PI. That's just not that's not contemplated in the regulations as I see it. Uh, and I'm I'm wrong about this because some people there are a lot of people who think that it is. But um, the new guidance how, though does allow. The, for you're oh, you're talking about from the DCT perspective, okay? Yeah, because the, I think DCT and diversity kind of meet here at this. Okay. Topic. See, I was thinking about it more from the, in the end, there is just one PI. So referring sites is not, to me, when you say, say the word referring sites, I think of that as there's a PI at each site. And then there's a central PI. You can't have multiple PIs. That's not what a PI is. Right, right. You can have an attending who's referring to a PI, and that's fine. And that would right. be con consistent with the DCD guidance. But you aren't going to have two PIs. Right, right. No, no. I'm see. I'm going even more practical. Like, just the way we do research now. Yeah. Just instead of having 100 sites in Miami. Right. You know, have maybe 20 in Miami. And then include some, some areas of the country where there are representation of, of diversity, whether it's African Americans. Sh shout out to Brad for going to Arkansas. He's going to have, like, 100% African American enrollment in some of his studies. You know, I places would take like Yuma, places like El Paso, places like Rio Grande, like that that you can do it. It's just the big pharma is risk averse because if you tell them now, they'll say, "Well, yeah, but we need the experience of the PI." So uh, it's something to consider, but uh, for the study now, it's not going to work. Well, it's not going to work cuz you need an entrepreneur to go out there and make it happen. And and struggle with the crappy studies for the first year like I did. Until now, all of a sudden, oh, yeah, well, you have experienced PIs now. Well, yeah, we struggled through, like, some crappy studies to get there. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I begin to question is I would go one step even more practical than that. I'm wondering if we would go – I think I can see two models that are emerging. Um, one model is possibly going to be um, – and I've, I've sort of – struggled with this the whole time, which is this idea of what role will pharmacies play? And I say this as a pharmacist, just to be clear again, Dan, as usual, not giving legal advice, not give, giving uh, clinical advice. I got to pump up Darshan real quick as a sidebar. <laughs> so be, I'll be an attorney sidebar real quick. Darshan is an attorney and a pharmacist licensed, but, and there's only like a dozen people like him in the world. Uh, if you talk about research experience, like maybe one of one, this is a one of yeah, one rare, this is a rare NFT. Like if you can get there, John, it's rare. <laughs> That's not useful. To be an NFT right now is hugely problematic. <laughs> Give it 10 years. But this is not legal advice and not medical advice. Right, thank you. Sorry, I should have started with that. But the horse with no name in the desert, you know. That's pretty the good. The ocean that. is just a desert with, with fish under underneath. That's, Wait, what? That's, that song, the intro song, Brad Hightower inspired. Yeah, but but there's no fish underneath in that song. Yeah, he said it in the third verse. It's one of my favorite. Really? Songs. The ocean is a desert with the fish underneath. He's saying that basically a desert and an ocean couldn't be like further from each other, but they're actually the same thing. They're both mm -hmm. like if when you're in the middle of the ocean, you know, you're out in the wilderness. When you're out in the middle of the desert, it's the same concept. You know, it's just you don't think about desert and ocean. The guy was stoned out of his mind when he wrote that song. So but it makes a lot of sense. Sure. Let's go with that. Shout out to Brad Hightower. Shout out to Brad Hightower. 
Um, so I, I think the point I was make. Actually, I forget the point I was making. Yeah, the marijuana tends to do that when you like disrupt the conversation with a marijuana sidebar. But you said there's something even more practical. Ah, so we're talking about the the types of sort of decentralized research and how that might play into diversity. Um, I think one will probably land up becoming as as pharmacies become more mainstream as part of the research sites. I think one of the things you might start seeing is you might still have see a small research site, say one in Yuma, for argument's sake. But but that one, the PI there suddenly is managing uh, patients who are not only in Yuma, but patients who are all over the state of Arizona, where there isn't a another PI that they can go to. Mm-hmm. So that and, and the pharmacy lands up being the place where the medication is stored. So that yeah. would be quite consistent with the DCT guidance. Could be, um, or the pharmacy, yeah, or the pharmacy, yeah, good point. Or the pharmacy is the place where patients from outside of the PI's practice are, right? But they still need a PI. So either that pharmacy becomes the place where you're going to do the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, recruiting? The recruiting, which is one of the strategies people are talking about. But I, I think that's a hard, for me personally, I think pharmacies doing the recruiting is a harder strategy. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm sure people have thought through this. Um, I, I think pharmacies be, being the place where you can sort of put up posters, maybe there's an angle there. The filtering from saying that here's a study to are you qualified for the study is harder, especially with pharmacists right now. I don't know if you guys have been following the big shortage of pharmacists, but pharmacists are saying we don't want to work because they're just you're just putting too much on us. You're expecting one person to do something yeah. that... When I was working as a pharmacist, it took three, four people to do. And they now don't, we're just honestly, they don't get paid that much, pharmacists. Like, I'm not going to go down that path. I got, we got paid pretty well as pharmacists, to be quite honest. But that was uh, what, back in the day, not anymore. Back in the day. No, but it's still, it's, compared to the average income, <laughs> pharmacists get paid pretty well. But, but, but it doesn't matter job. what you get paid at a certain point, right? Yeah. At a certain point, if you can't do your job properly, and yeah. you, you're going to end up hurting someone. You'd so here, rather not do your, do your job. But here's my point. And then shout out to my sponsor, Inato. They're actually like, they help sites. And they actually, like front and center is diversity in their questionnaires. And this is why they keep growing in business for the sponsor. Absolutely free for sites to use. I have a study. So I'm going back to the whole, the small biotechs will innovate in this space, in this little vertical, faster than the big pharma. And then the big pharma will see that it's okay that the FDA didn't kill them, and then they will adopt it too. So when I first moved out to Yuma, the only studies I got were from sponsors I never heard of. It wasn't Eli Lilly. It wasn't Data. Right. It was these small sponsors you don't even want to work with necessarily most of the time. Because right. they want to take, they're willing to take the risk. That's their competitive advantage. Now, what we're seeing with DCT elements is these small biotechs are designing their studies just like you said. We have a study at our site in Yuma, but we can take patients from basically all of like the Western Arizona. So from Havasu all the way down, like three hour drive. We actually have a patient who did this. Right. They designed their study to where they only need to come in like twice for the whole study, like physically come in. But we store the IP, but we give the IP to them for the whole study. Right. And then the rest of the visits are virtual. Correct. And I think that's one way to get diversity. The ironic thing is in the example I'm talking about, the patient was Caucasian. <laughs> so it doesn't but, matter. Right. The the proof of concepts there. Like it's it's right. being done already, but it's being done by the smaller biotechs. So these smaller biotechs are the ones taking taking a chance because they have no choice. I'll say a few different things to that. So number one, I'm trying to make notes as I go along with this. So number one, my experience tends to be the people, Kev, uh, Kevin probably has just put up a comment. So you want to put that up? No, Collaborating no, no, no. with historically black colleges can help boost diversity. 100%. 100 that they can. But the problem with, with that is it's never been difficult trying to collaborate with historically black, black colleges. The issue has been that people have been reticent to do it, have not been eager to do it. And that's the problem we need to fix. The problem yeah. is not accessing the, those patients in historically black colleges. 
Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's sort of people, people talk about the, uh, this concept of food deserts. Have you heard that term before? No, but it's a great topic considering the song. <laughs> You're really into the song. Uh, but people talk about food deserts and food deserts are basically places where you can't get a nutritious meal. Um, in the same way, there are health deserts. And, and the idea is that in many situations, you will have a, you'll, you'll have people who need the help, people who want to participate in clinical trials, people who want healthcare access. And there's just simply not enough out there. And I think decentralized studies will enable access to those patients. And I think that that's the advantage we're looking at. It does, but you need you still need an intermediary to get those patients Without a doubt. aware. And this is where the one end healths of the world come in. Like Huma said, hey, Huma, nice to meet you. Speaking, this is exactly, Huma, I, we need to do a podcast, by the way, right? I'm, I just met her this weekend in Dallas. Okay. And we never got a chance to do a podcast. Huma, let's do the podcast, okay? Like message me on LinkedIn. Let's do it. Uh, if you have time today, I work from home all day. Let's let's get it done. Huma is an amazing person. Everybody needs to connect. She's a dermatologist, actually, and she okay. works at a site in Canada. So it's not a matter of diversity in clinicians, but it's about community engagement and education about trials. Marginalized communities have a lot of reservation about study drugs. Exactly. Huma, we talked about this a little bit. Let me bring up the meeting we were just at, Darshan. Okay. I know it's anecdotal, and you attorneys don't like that, but who cares? <laughs> Look, what Kelvin just said. Collaborating with historically black colleges can help boost diversity in clinical research and its workforce. Why is the workforce important? Because you're not, I believe you're not going to get diversity of patients if you don't have a diversity of the workforce. It just makes it a lot easier. At I agree with you 100%, but I think we have to, you've got to create the environment for this because what you don't want is a scenario where the workforce feels like they're enabling diversity and they're still betraying the people that they are helping serve. So you've got to enable them to actually truly be enabling diversity. So, so it's not about the, the, the oh, we have four black uh, CRCs on staff. Right. Well, right. But, but what, is, what is it that you're doing so that they can actually reach out to their patients? Yes. Are and, they empowered? And, are exactly. Are those coordinators empowered? Yes, I can't wait to interview Gracia, my new coordinator on this, because as soon as she she got hired, literally three weeks in, we started getting more Hispanic patients. I said, how how did we make this work? <laughs> oh, well, I posted on Facebook that right. we do studies and all these people message me. No surprise. They're yeah. all Latino, all of them. But let me tell you, this meeting I was just at with Huma, yeah. right? Big investigator meeting, big pharma. Like 400 people. Do you know, Darshan, how many just, I was just looking around, bored. You're in these meetings all day. So I'm in the back. Look, I like to sit in the back. I'm in the back looking at everyone. Do you know how many African Americans I saw sitting in the crowd? No. Two. Okay. Two. What were the rest, though? What was the other breakdown? Caucasian. Mm Mm-hmm. Middle Eastern, Asian, some Hispanic. There weren't Give that me a little bit of a breakdown, though. I mean, you go, you're giving oh, me... Oh, it was like 80% Caucasian. Okay. And the rest, other. And from other, there was like two African Americans mm-hmm. that I saw. And I was there the whole day. Like, I saw right, right. everyone that walked in, I saw. Like, there were some African Americans on stage. Sure. Because the big pharma brought like a patient advocate and they happen to be African American. Right. Let Huma, you put in the answers. What was the breakdown? Ethnic breakdown. Huma, she's a doctor, she's more analytical. You put <laughs> down the percentages. Tell Darshan I'm not lying, man. <laughs> Tell Darshan I'm not lying. So, but here's the point the hypocrisy is like, we're this big pharma. We got like, a panel. They did like this fake podcast where they had like a person they paid to host the panel. Yeah. And then they had a patient advocate. Yeah. That clearly does this for a living. Went on stage. She was African American. 
Sure. She talked about her experiences as a patient and all this. Yeah. And then they had like another doctor. He was African American. He wasn't part of the study, but he was a PI at a big AMC. And then sure. you had two other physicians or PhDs. I don't know. So they're up there talking about diversity. But in the crowd that they, the sponsor, I'm not going to, it's hard to like shut them out. I, I like the sponsor. They paid for those people to be up there. But they also handpick every site on in the crowd. So was this for a trial or was this? This is for a trial. Well, this is for an individual trial. trial. Okay. So my point is, like, they're virtue signaling the right message. But right. their actions, and maybe it's the site. Maybe they're going to say, well, a sponsor's not in charge of hiring staff at the at the sites. Well, why aren't there more sites than in places like Mississippi or Arkansas or places like that? And Humus, just so somebody co-signs what I say, you are not lying. <laughs> we're we're going to need more than you're not lying, Dan. Yeah, Humus. <laughs> Archon's an attorney. Like, he's ready to, like, throw something at me right now. <laughs> but seriously, like, the point is still made like there's just not diversity at the sites yeah and so, and they're let, the ones picking the sites piece. so i think that there's there's different types of diversity right i think one of the big things i talk about around diversity is we always sort of go back to oh we want diversity no one talks about diversity of what are we talking about just race are we talking about sex? Are we talking about sexual orientation? Are we right talking- now just race? Let's make it simple. What? Why? Because what about vets? We gotta start. We gotta start with something. I think do- that's the easiest thing to start with. They do- already I'm do the diversity of, of sex. They do the the diversity of sex. They have a cap. When we reach this number of females, we're only gonna allow males. They even brought it up on a slide, and the IRT will lock. And you can only enroll males. So, so we've got two done. So, so there's a hierarchy of of diversity that we need to consider. Yeah, like Huma, Huma's with me. Ethnicity at this point, Darshan. Why discuss all this other stuff with the, you know, I know like gender fluidity and all that's important, but let's talk about just ethnicity at this point. It's How about vets though? Thing. How about what? Vets. Veterans. Yeah. Should we sure. have more veterans in studies? How do you make sure that we're giving those guys a handicap? Sure, disabled, but the, the FDA didn't say we need more vets or and disabled in studies. We need more. They said diversity. The patient, yeah, they said diversity. We need the patients to look. We need yeah. the participants to uh-huh. look like the people taking the drug yeah. when it's approved. Yeah, and I'm not disagreeing with that statement. Right. But But my point becomes... It, when you use the term diversity, you create this automatic hierarchy of what diversity is important. <laughs> yeah, but you attorneys are really good at this stuff. Everybody and their mama knows what we mean and what the FDA means. And that's the point. We're, we're sort of playing codes, aren't we? We're now saying, <laughs> like Kevin, for example, you don't want to touch clinical trials in the VA. Um. Huma says I would go for prisoner. <laughs> IRBs would shut you down in a heartbeat. Actually, that's not true. You, you, no? We do see studies involving prisoners. But just for prisons. like no, not, not just for, but they okay. can be part of the studies. Okay. But there have been, I teach bioethics. I used to teach bioethics. I haven't taught that in okay. probably about two years. But that's one of the big simple, questions right? uh, at University of the Sciences oh. um, in the biomedical writing program. But... Um, one of the big questions used to be, what if you gave, say, six months off for every patient to participate in a clinical trial? Is that, co- is that coercive? Of course. And then everybody, every prisoner would do it. <laughs> and that's the question. So my point is, again, the, the point I was making, we, we sort of went off track talking about prisoners. But the, the point I was making was, we talk about diversity, and, but we're, what we're talking about in code for is we're talking about race diversity. Of course. And and you say, of course, uh, IRB, Uma, Uma's going, 
Uh, you can't go against it. This um, yeah. topic. Like, oh my god, I do a podcast today. I hope you're available. <laughs> you you will be available. Uh, once. I do say, of course, because everybody knows that's what we need. And but I think that's my point. I think so. We've got to wait another forty years before we start talking about bets and we talk start talking about um, what do you call it? Um, handicap people. Probably, to be honest with you. I think that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the 80 20 rule, like, you want diversity, what's the lowest hanging fruit? It's getting more minorities to participate in studies. Okay. So, okay, so we, we're now playing the 80 20 rule, is what I'm hearing. Okay. That's so, the way I look at it. Okay, hold, hold on, hold on. Beautiful. Like you set me up beautifully. You set me up beautifully. So that's let me, let me play this out. Terms, guys, by the way. <laughs> So what you just said is the 80-20 rule. <laughs> so if the 80-20 rule applies and we only care about like large volumes of diversity, right, where you can see the biggest impact, what you're now saying is that Asians don't need to be worried about diversity anymore because the, the representative population is, is like 2% in the country. No, no. What I'm saying oh, is... Oh, 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 oh. We were still playing 80-20, weren't we? We're playing 80-20 of the problem, meaning, you. yes, there's all these minority groups uh -huh. disabled lgbtq I mean, uh, more more of the letters after it there's all yeah. all these minority sure. groups but the lowest hanging fruit is uh -huh. ethnicity so, well, so, so let's say ethnicity so that includes I, asians pacific islanders no no no, no, no. i'm, I'm, agree I'm agreeing with you i'm agreeing with you so so we're saying we're going to do uh, ethnicity. So let, let's stick with ethnicity. I'm not going down the other paths. Mm -hmm. Have we achieved diversity if we get only more of a black population in there? We have not affected any other populations. We made a we made progress. Is that is that the only standard we use then? No, but we've made progress compared to current. That's an improvement, and then mm -hmm. we can make improvement for. So when when do we know when we've made enough improvement to look at the next one? I guess when the FDA says, good job, sponsor, like your drugs approved. No, no, no. I'm still talking ethnicity. When you, how, What percentage do black uh, individuals need to be in the study before we go, okay, Hispanics, you're up next. And then Hispanics, you're done. Uh, Asians, you, you got next. Native Americans, you got next. Yeah, what, what exactly are we talking about here? I'm like a logical yeah, point yeah, of yeah. view. And I hope the way the FDA looks at it, I think they have based on the statements they made. They want the patient part population in the studies to match yeah. as close to one to one as the ethnic breakdown so in the US. Kevin, hold on, hold on. Let's pull up Kevin's comment. When you get 10% of blacks, that's his comment. Okay, so so we're just going to, and we'll play this out. So we're saying that we now have a percentage based system. That we keep having to go down. This, so number what Kevin just said. Numbers need to be representative of the U.S. population. So if okay. there's eight percent Asians in the U.S., so, so we're going to go down a hierarchy on. pathway, basically. And until you you hit that number, you don't get to move on. So we're playing. What what is it? Is it Go? I forget. I forget which game that was. Uh, it's like Monopoly. 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 Like Monopoly, where you uh, you haven't hit uh, the the you haven't hit Go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Right. But you're talking about as if we're going to achieve this anytime soon. Like, that's not going to be, that'll be a good problem to have. When we get enough African Americans, it's time to, like, let's focus on Asians now. Like, that's a, pro that, to me, that's progress. To, to me, it says, I, I think I'm going back to Kevin's comment, which is enhanced diversity of vulnerable populations. I think that's the angle you aim for. But the question then is, what is a vulnerable population? Yeah. And and is a vulnerable population only based on ethnicity? So it goes back to the original question. Let me do vulnerable population definition by Oxford. Is this literally Googling this? Yeah. Columbia School of Nursing. Individuals who experience greater risk factors for poor health outcomes due to their racial or ethnic status or sexual preferences. Also vulnerable are children, the elderly, Socioeconomically disadvantaged. So, so, so let's let's injured. let's play this out. Let let me play this out. So, here here's what I'm hearing now. I'm now going to do a digital campaign because Uma just mentioned a digital campaign. Can I now start doing a digital campaign that 
only targets black individuals until we get to that 10% number that Kevin mentioned a few minutes ago. Because you've got to spend your dollars somewhere. You can, yeah. So you and wouldn't a lot spend of it on... That would be happy to help you with this. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Um, I, th- I would say yes. Well, so you, you wouldn't spend it across the board. You would no. spend it... Interesting. Here's why. Okay. Every site... I'm in Yuma. We have yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe... There's maybe like 8% African American population in our community. Maybe. Sure. Uh-huh. It's probably 60 Caucasian, like 40 Hispanic, and then 20 other. Uh-huh. So if if I'm given that budget as a site, this is back to my initial point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I should be able to use that money as I see fit for what is most likely to achieve like the outcomes the sponsor wants at my site. I'm not going to be able to enroll unlimited African American or Asians in my community, so that ad would make no sense for my community. That so what ad, ad would in make Philly. sense in Philly. You, yeah, in Philly, go crazy with everything you can. In Philly, in these bigger cities, you can actually throw the money across the board and say, "Hey, you know what? We have this ad for Af- like targeting African Americans. We have this ad targeting Hispanics. We have Asians." But you're, you're thinking at a site level. You're not thinking yeah. at a sponsor level. A sponsor no, and level, I don't think sponsors should get involved. That's in that exactly level. what the law is saying. The sponsors have to make a diversity plan. They can make the plan that empowers the sites. And this is exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> the big pharma, this is like how they want to empower their sites. No, no. Like, yeah. we got to get 10 committees to prove this. The small mm-hmm. biotechs are saying, go for it. Like, this is why we hired you. You know why small biotechs say that, by the way? You, they, you have no they have no plan. They have no plan. Exactly. Plan. I know, but that's better. That's what? better outcomes, man. Better. But we don't know they're better outcomes. The we lit- you're literally don't... telling me chaos is what reigns. But the big pharma don't even discover drugs anymore. They just buy the ones that are promising. Sure. I mean, within reason, but sure, let's go with that assumption for the most part, right? Let's let's assume for the most part, pharma buy large pharma buys. Small pharma. Uh, it's no longer lucrative to you. I'm not disagreeing with you. That, yeah, yeah. That's why. That's why I wasn't disagreeing with you. I was like, yeah, for the most part, you're right. Uh, but but my point being, what what you're really getting. So I'll give you two different responses to that. The first response is what you're admitting. Is Huma and Huma goes so, go so well together? I like uh, what, what you're admitting is number one that bi- small biotechs, and again, I work with small biotechs all the time, and I, I work with small it. sites all the time. But um, but it, for the most part, they have no plan because they're new. That's the whole point. They don't know right. what they don't know. They're right. hoping the CRO guides them. Um, oh, that's well, the that's first a bad part. Strategy. That's a bad move, by the way. Happens all the time. Um, but here's the other part of this whole thing. The other part is. I'm now involved doing a bunch of M&A transactions. And when you're buying these companies, excuse my language, but it's a total shit show of what you're buying. You're going, who came up with this? And why did you come up with it? And, and usually they'll sort of fumble their way through an answer. And the, in many cases, it doesn't matter because you're going to buy them anyways. You're going to try to fix the problem because overall their product is a good one. But the idea is how do you do it in a way and really targets diversity, and and what does diversity mean? I mean, we can we can have a whole conversation on compliance. We can have a whole conversation on fraud pod. We can have a whole conversation on just all these different pieces. And depending on what you look at, you're going to find different issues that right. these companies will have. But let's focus on the issue of diversity. And the fo- and the issue of diversity, you just mentioned, you will start by spending all your money in you in. Uh, in Yuma, there we go. In Yuma, confused with Uma. With Uma, exactly. It's like, wait, which one are we at right now? Uh, but but you just admitted you will spend all your money to, to get a percentage of the African American population. I, I don't I don't have a problem with targeting the African American population. But what you just Native Americans is what I would use because that's most okay. Who is going to join my studies here? Okay. And Brad, when he opens his site in Arkansas, I don't even know if it's public, my bad, Brad. He's going to do it for African Americans because that's who's most likely to join his studies in that community. So, so, you can argue what diversity is, 
Right. But we can't argue what it isn't. And what it isn't is what me and Uma both saw with our own eyes over there at that meeting. So wait, those are two separate conversations. One is yeah. who is finding the diverse population? Right. And what is the diverse population? Right. We can skip that last one. So oh, <laughs> this we can is doing skip that last one. <laughs> throw, it, throw it out. Because <laughs> you want to increase diversity. It doesn't matter if you get more Hispanics, more Asians, more. I would disagree get with more. you. Just no, I, I disagree with you. Because what you just admitted to me earlier was this idea that I will only look for a certain type of diverse population if the goal was represent the entire U.S. population. Right. right. Because and you aren't going to find anyone who meets a certain goal. This was actually culture. literally... Uh, let, me, let me finish this thought. Yeah, go this, ahead. This is literally what the U.S. Supreme Court said is a, said is a problem. Yeah. When the U.S. Supreme Court said that if you are trying to... Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, if, if you are, in the case of admissions, they right. said you can't just go, oh, we've got uh, two different uh, individuals and the only thing they differ in is race. You can't just pick one based on race. You've got to have a bigger uh, funnel top and put as many more people into that funnel top and then let whatever happens fall, filter through. What you're saying is I'm just going to pick based on whatever I think is the easiest thing to do, which is I'll target the population I want. Question is, if we continue to do that as an industry, will this get toppled over? By, will, will diversity requirements themselves get thrown out before they even have a chance to mature in light of the Supreme Court decision? So there's two the there's two strategies to go at this. So comparing like Yuma clinical trials to Harvard, yeah, is not correct because <laughs> we're in a community that uh -huh. is mostly Hispanic. Sure. And Native American and some sure. Caucasian. So there's not really diversity here. So when I say I'm targeting... Wait, I, you just mentioned and, diversity. How is it not diverse? I'm confused with that statement. There's no diversity in the sense that there's not like a multitude of different ethnic backgrounds for us to choose from, like Harvard struggles with... But on you, did, you did mention three different audiences, right? Uh, right. Hispanic, we'll enroll all American, we'll Native enroll American. All. We'll okay. enroll all. Right? Exactly. It's it's mostly his in my site. It's mostly Hispanic, Caucasian, and Native Americans. Sure. Like, and then the rest is like everyone else. And of course, when there's African American that wants to come through, we're like, yeah, this is awesome. Like, we need yeah. more diversity. Absolutely. But unlike Harvard, we're yeah. not getting like referrals from all over the place with all kinds of ethnic background where they actually right. have to decide. We this is like. We're put in a we're in a community. We have to enroll patients from our community, right? right? So the way I see, like your 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 question is really how do the sites deal with it, and how do the sponsors strategically select sites right. across the country or across right. the world? But let's keep it country for simplicity's sure. sake for yeah. their study. And I believe sponsors dropping the ball by not investing in sites in underserved areas in the United States. So, so, I, so I'm agreeing with you that they should be um, investing in sites in underserved communities. And, you're, um, I, and I would argue, and I agree with Kevin, for example, when he talks about, you know what, I'll go after um, historically black colleges, target them. I, I worry a little bit about just the idea of targeting. To me, that, that screams a little more Tuskegee than I'm comfortable with, just sort yeah. of off the top of my head. Um, but uh, but let's assume that they, they have their appropriate... Uh, controls in place. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we go down that path and you, you've got the Yuma site that has more, um, more of a Hispanic population and maybe some of the Native American population in there as well. Mm -hmm. and, and then you, you, you find Edison, New Jersey, where you're going to get all the freaking Indians you can possibly handle. Uh, <laughs> but, but my point being, that is what that diversity plan that the sponsors are going to be doing will address. Now, if you go in there, Dan, and you start saying, I'm going to take all of my budget and target it towards the African-American population, what you might land up doing is skewing the entire results away from what had been part of that overall diversity plan because of what you were doing. So you didn't go after your natural population. What you, what you went for is this other population that you in your, again, the, um, in, with good intention, you try to get all these other people. What about a clinic in Southside Chicago? I mean, you don't even need to target African Americans. 
Right, exactly. You just put an ad out, hey, we got a study, yeah. you're going to get almost 100% African Americans. But where's the, clinic, where's the clinic in Southside Chicago? I didn't see any of their coordinators at this meeting. I, I have no comment. Like, I would argue that they should have been, right? Well, I guess with them. <laughs> so yeah. too. But why are they not? Because the the sponsors, they have sales reps that go into every community. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the extra pitch. Hey, you know what? This is this whole thing about research. There's some yeah. sponsors I can't give a shout out because it's very early. I signed a CDA. They're working on exactly this. How do we train clinicians and community clinics in these areas to start doing research? And me and the LICR people might be busy for a long time, by the way. I would go one step further. I think one of the big things you need to solve, and, and this is like preaching to the converted, if you will. Um, but I think what you need to start off with is if we can just get, um, <laughs> I like Kevin's comments. He's got some good comments in there. But um, if, if we can just get, um, sorry, I, for, I forgot where I was going with the conversation. Um, this is a lively. This is a lively convo. Well, that's that's exactly the goal. Um, uh, this is a better convo than that at the investigator meeting, by the way, because it's real things. It's not just talking about feelings or what everyone agrees is the right thing, right? Oh, more diversity in trial. Yeah, of course. Uh, treat your patients properly. Yeah, talk to them like a human. Of course. <laughs> I mean, oh, well, what I was talking about was yeah. training. What okay. I was talking about is. One of the reasons, and, and this is going back to the point you were making, Dan, where you were talking about this idea that um, we need, and again, I think Kevin was talking about this as well, um, how do you get a diverse workforce that can connect with your diverse audience? And I think part of the problem we have is that every sponsor comes in and says, oh, we're going to do uh, training on GCPs, for example. And... At some point, you've done all the GCP training you can possibly do. If someone can just come in and just go, here's the standard GCP training everyone does. And right. FDA, so FDA put out a thing, I think, last week on uh, GCP training. If everyone just says, as long as you do this FDA training, we will consider you GCP trained. Now let's move on to the study-specific training. And I think that is a limitation. For all all PIs, all sub eyes, all train, all staff at the site, it it cuts out what is repetitive work. But I think if you can start addressing that problem, you're going to get more more PIs who want to be part of this, more staff who want to be part of clinical research, and I think that's how you start targeting. Eliminate some of the barriers to participating in clinical research. Well, I think like SIP shared investigator portal. Yeah, made attempts at them. doing that. They, I mean, they share the GCP from the sites. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. I, but the issue know. is not whether it's available. Everyone has a bunch of stuff available. The reason I picked the FDA one yeah. is because it's coming from the FDA. So no one can argue it's inadequate. Fair enough. I mean, GCP is just the beginning, though. Like we give that's day one of CRC sure. Academy. Just get this up. I literally tell students this: do this GCP training. Just get it over with. Yeah. All right. It just teaches you like the overview of what's important. We're going to get into the nitty gritty in the next three months. So just get yeah. this out of the way. Yeah. It's no, it's no good. Like it's of no practical use. It's good from a regulatory perspective because it checks the box. Yeah. But from a practical use, it's not good. It just tells you not to harm patients. Like, well, it depends on what you're training. Everybody and, and already knows that. <laughs> so it's funny you say that. Because it's not as simple as that. So I do a whole talk, a two-hour talk on research misconduct. Yeah. And um, the two-hour talk is still not hitting in the right places because last week, no, October 4th. So I guess it's been a month at this point. Um, yeah. Um, ORI, the Office of Research Integrity, came out and said, we apparently need to fix what is happening around research integrity. And they're trying to change the definitions. Um, and that's going to have a dramatic impact on who can participate in, in uh, as, as sort of staff. Uh, they were tar primarily, I think you're seeing a large impact in large academic institutions, but it's going to flow down to sites themselves. Um, and you have more reason to want to invest in the underserved communities then. 
the, <laughs> the status quo yeah. is let's use the same sites over and over again for all these trials. Yeah. Well, if let's say what whatever percentage you want, 10% of them are questionable according to ORI standards. Yeah. Right? Or maybe it's higher. Maybe it's 20. Well, sure. bye-bye. And then bring in like 20% new sites from different parts of the country that are more diverse. That's happening naturally anyways. I mean, it's only 3% of physicians or it's a constant turnover of PIs. So Right, but the ones that like become stable are recycled over and over again. I mean, this is sure. why sites get acquired. This is why they won't look at acquire. They being the venture capital won't look to acquire until the site hits certain metrics where they're considered stable, like part of the yeah. infrastructure now, right? Yeah. It's usually a million EBITDA. Um, is that so right? Yeah. Is that the number? Yeah, it's about a million EBITDA yearly revenue that um, you're considered like part of this ecosystem now. Like you're, no matter what kind of market, you'll still get studies. Your PIs and staff have been vetted. So you need more, you always need new sites. Now, here, here's a comment Kevin made. Now, I don't know if that's a supporting Kevin's comment. Kevin's on it, man. We need, yeah, to, right? we need to do something. If you have a di- diverse workforce, you make less mistakes. I don't know if that's true. Based on what? Yeah, I don't know if that's true either. Um, I'm sure Kelvin meant something by that. Yeah, there must be more to that co- uh, comment. And maybe it's easy even right, but there's more of a context that we're missing. Uh, make less mistakes, create value prep for org's bottom line. I think mistakes are mistakes no matter Right, it's not like <laughs> the diversity. Right, we right. have mistakes. I have to write a capital plan later today for a mistake we made as a site. But I mean, those happen regardless. So here's a question: the question is, if you start doing diversity plans and you don't hit it, do you do? Inato does it. Inato does it. They do. Inato does yeah. it. Front I think it's what... You're really good at the whole sort of marketing for other people thing. So good for I you. And I love them. I love these guys. They put the diversity. Yes, they hold sponsors, hold them to it, to their numbers. And Inato will hold the site to it. It's a free service for sites. But if you put that, you're going to enroll 20% African-Americans and you only put like 10. I mean, yeah, that's a good thing. But Inato on your next study will say, well, your last one, you only did 10. Are you sure you want to keep saying 20? And so, so, yeah, they, they have, they're developing their plan. Shout out to Dina. Shout out to Dina. Do you know Dina? No. Dina's <laughs> awesome. Dina's really? awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, Kevin is based on creating a collaborative. Eh, I mean, I think you can create a collaborative environment. A collaborative in environment, establishing trust. <sighs> Look, I know what I saw and I know what I continue to see. Yeah. And if I go to an investigator meeting anytime in the near future, which I don't think I will. I wanted to go once in a while just to see what's yeah. new. Sad thing is, man, same old thing. Maybe the tech is a little bit different. Like, there's more DCT elements. There's a vendor for this, a vendor for that. DCT, they're like, little improvements are, are cool. Like, they have this e-consent where they have, like, multimedia embedded into the consent. I thought that was awesome. That's an element of DCT that I usually bash on that I think is amazing. But when it comes to this topic of diversity, I don't think we're going to get anywhere seeing the representation in the workforce that I saw at that meeting. So do you think the biggest problem, the biggest hurdle to diversity is the lack of diversity in patient population or subject populations is lack of diversity in um, the, the workforce? In the workforce and in the representation of the clinics and the communities that are underserved. So for the underserved, they usually do like inner city, right? Like AMCs are usually in the middle of the cities. Sure. So they're supposed to check that box, but they don't really do that. Everybody knows they don't really like, they're not getting the job done. Why do you say that though? What makes you think that? Because we wouldn't have this problem. Otherwise that's the status quo. The no, status quo could... is like using the same AMCs and key opinion leaders over and over again. I'm not sure I agree with that statement. Um, so I think it depends on the the AMCs are often used because they have access to patient populations and they're often used because they have access to the right investigators. Um, so to me, this idea that I, and again, the investigators to me 
are often chosen because they're right for a specific disease state. So exactly. So to me, um, I'm I'm unsure whether um, being in a situation where uh, you choose the same same. I don't know why you would end up choosing the same PI because I would imagine that each study is different. Uh, same AMC, same institution. Okay, so. If, if, if they were getting the job done, we wouldn't have like a need for small sites. The last thing these sponsors want to do is deal with all these fragmented clinics all over the place. They want to; they'd rather have everything centralized. Let's do with UCSF what? for San Francisco, UCLA for LA. Sure, sure. You know they don't want to deal with people like Yuma Clinical Trials and you know the long tail. I mean, it's inefficient for them to deal with all of us. They'd rather just have their hubs. That was part of the virtual trial argument. Let's have these hubs yeah. in different areas. It didn't work. The AMC model didn't work either. That's why private industry... But that's like saying the exploded. SMO model doesn't work. I think we try it every five years. It's just someone someone comes up with a, ah, if we'd done this one thing, exactly. everything would have worked. Exactly. But so Why didn't it work then? Why didn't you do that one thing? <laughs> well, so we, we didn't have the technology at that time, or we didn't have the data at that time, or I wasn't there to ch- fix the problem. Right, that. it's always something. Right, exactly. awesome. But it's it's the same thing. You need more, you need new, you need research naive, in my opinion, research naive investigators. Yeah. Um that don't have recycled patients in their studies. You need yeah. diverse background. This is to me the solution's simple. Now implementing it's complicated because at at the sponsor level it is. Yeah, yeah, Keisha, I'll have to do a Kappa. Yeah. Kelvin says patient a- attribution impacts the bottom line. Look, um, I can't way. wait. I can't wait to see the first sponsor that said, "Hey, here's our good results." FDA and FDA said, "Well, you know." But the, I don't, I, Dan. I think you're fundamentally misunderstanding how these studies get designed. You don't go to the FDA after you've done the study and go, "What do you think?" You, you're usually no, making you it. submit your results. Yeah, them. but you start off by having a bunch of meetings with the FDA of before course, you do that, of course. And then so they hopefully, say, "Well, we want." representation yeah too, and sponsors say all right well we got the right sites they're amcs they should do that okay good right. good, good right and then when the results come out yeah well what was the what was the ethnic breakdown eh, it's not what we would hope well i think there's cer- only there's only a certain amount of stuff you can do as a sponsor right because you can't also exclude patients because of their race but they are because of gender and that's the question you've got to start balancing. I need an attorney for that one. <laughs> if we hit, if we hit a uh, enrollment, they had for one of the studies. This is the second study now. Yeah. Once we hit X percentage of females, IRT will be locked. You cannot sure. enroll another female. I wonder if you tell that female participant at your site, "Hey, we can't enroll you because you're female." If she's I got a lawsuit. I'm not touching that question right now because I don't know enough about that specific situation. You got to go research that one. Man. I got to research yeah. that one. If that yeah, that's, came down come. that's coming. It's not that coming on our site because we'll get her in another study. We'll tell her, hey, look, this is what they want. It's not us. We want to enroll you. Yeah, yeah, Let's yeah. put you in this study here. Right. But I don't know. I, I, I feel coming. like it's coming. Yeah. Um, question is what happens then? Uh, and also because I think in the case of, um, in, in all situations, the sponsor doesn't actually know who's in the study. So you, it's hard, which is why I think you're going towards diversity plans and not diversity requirements. Um, because, right. because I don't think sponsors, at least right now, are, are enabled to kind of go, once you hit 10% African-American people, no more African American. No, no, but it Why would not? never be that. It would be the more likely scenario would be we've hit enough Caucasians. No more Caucasians. It really depends on where you're doing the study. Nah, you do it at Penn. I can tell you that that's no, not. No, they do, they do these things study wide in the IRT, like I'm sorry? across the board. They do this study wide in the IRT across the board. I know what you mean. I'm just saying. Again, you you can always position your study in different ways. So if you do your study at historically by by colleges, do it. In West Philadelphia, I say that because I live in Philly. So I, I uh, just Sixers. To be clear. go Sixers. 
goes, Dan, you know better than to talk to me about sports. You really know better about this. Uh, just, just to be clear, Dan and I have been doing this since 2009 or so. And yeah, they're trying to know Alan Iverson was. A- <laughs> No, no, no. I didn't know who Allen Iverson was. Okay. Here, here's the situation. You were you were telling me something, and you were like, let me tell you about sports. I was like, uh, uh like, you have no idea what I'm talking about, dude. Wait, do you know who no. Bryce Harper is? No. Phillies. Is he really? Okay. The Phillies are? Okay. Yeah. He, he, unfortunately, my girlfriend's having a great time right there watching and laughing at how <laughs> little I know. So this is not helpful. Fair enough, man. There's <laughs> stuff I know very little on also. Um. But no, Darshan, I know like the yeah. hypothetical question is, well, what happens when we hit a limit of African Americans? Yeah. And that's not going to happen in a pra- in a practical. It depends place. on how you set the study up. Is my point. Yeah, well, they'll never be set up like that, and they're not even going to be set up to limit Caucasians. I've never heard that yet. Well, not yet, but that's that's what we're talking about, right? What right, what right. does the new diversity plan mean? How is this going to affect sites? Well, should that would sites mean it's be targeting the natural population, or should they be targeting um, a population that um, that they should probably be hoping to sort of pull in? Um, they should be uh, targeting their natural population. But that's not what I you said. Know. No, it is what I said because for the there's so now we're getting into why different ethnic groups do research. Okay. Historically speaking, and I can only there's. People can do hour-long podcasts on African Americans with Tuskegee and the reasons sure, why. Absolutely. For Hispanics, they're very distrustful of medicine in general. Sure. Caucasians, less of a problem. So I don't need to target Caucasians in my community to get them into studies. I need to make extra efforts to get Hispanics in my studies. So should, let, let's pick on this. Should you should you target the Jewish population? I mean, they have. We don't really have one. No, you don't. But I'm, I'm, my, my point being, um, there's loads of history, for example, from the Nazi prison experiments mm-hmm. that talk about the destruction of the population. They should be. So when do you not target a population? So it's just sort of your Anglo-Saxons you it's don't target? Just Anglo, that's the current... I mean, we target everyone, right? But we make extra efforts for the... Uh, there you go. Kevin Gray has a great point. You need to target whites in rural areas. Do we now say, well, so so only white Anglo-Saxons in the middle of a city, in an urban environment? Basically. <laughs> basically, that's the status quo. Look, we'll target everyone. Sure. We want, we need, we have hard No, when we say target, we're saying that everyone's allowed, but we're trying to recruit more from these other uh, ethnic groups just so we can have. I have an ad in the paper. Yeah. Not IRB approved. Come and get me, guys. Like, it's just very generic. We do a bunch of different studies. Here's the indications. Here's the QR code if you're interested. We have the same ad in Spanish. Yeah. So I'm targeting Hispanics and whites or Hispanics that speak English primarily. And anyone else that sees that ad. So we'll take anyone in these studies because the so, IE so criteria. Let's, let's say your site mm-hmm. was in Edison, New Jersey. So you have an Indian sounds population. Competitive. Right? It sounds competitive. No, no, no. The, the reason I was asking that question is, so naturally speaking, you do tend to have a Hispanic population you can target, and by, you can do that with language, right? So you yeah. pointed out that you had the ad in uh, Spanish. You can use the English ad because, well, that makes sense, dude. You'll have a but large it, interestingly population. Interestingly enough, in a place like Yuma, you can get your Hispanic population numbers in English. Oh, I'm sure you could. Yeah. But you, you you went and put the Spanish one in there anyways. Extra efforts. Yes. Yeah. Yes. My, my my question is, when you take that next step and and you went, um, do, do you spend the extra money to target the Indian population? Do you go, they'll have to come in through the English one. We're working with a, just Friday. And while I was in the investigator meeting, I was checking emails when they're talking about IRT nonsense. And the <laughs> big sponsored on a study told me, hey, we're actually trying to target Native Americans for this yeah, study. Yeah, great. Let's pick that out. But Native Americans... Like literally what that's happened. not really... Yeah, so they said, well, like, what kind of budget do you need and what? how can we help you? This mm-hmm. is a very progressive sponsor. So, hey, we would love access to those clinics. 
in the Native American, like on the reservation. Yeah. Um, lunch and learns. Of course. Yeah. So we're they want us to target Native Americans now because we're getting we're hitting our Hispanic and our Caucasian quotas. Yeah. And we even got an Asian in there just from the newspaper ad. I'm sorry, did you say got an Asian in there? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We got an Asian in there. Like they're probably what, two percent of Yuma, we got one in there. Um no Native Americans. But as an Asian, I <laughs> I'm going to laugh at the comment. We got an Asian in there. I don't even know what that means. It's it's a really funny visual to me. We got, <laughs> we get, we're hitting our numbers. Like yeah, we got, awesome. you know. Yeah. Sponsors want more Native Americans across the board. They're like, hey, we have a few sites in Arizona. They have a bunch of Native Americans around there. Let's yeah. let's target yeah. them. I mean, it it's, makes sense, right? You're not going to target a place that doesn't have Native Americans, like a community that doesn't. So, yeah, so we're trying to make extra efforts to reach them. So, common sense, man. I think a lot of this is, like, it's a touchy subject because you have to treat, we're all about equality in our country. Mm -hmm. And then you actually have to use different strategies for different minority groups. And they're not all equal in their sentiment towards research. I agree. I, th- I think it also comes down to the idea that we've got to, it's one thing to espouse a progressive attitude and say, we want diversity, but then you've got to put money down. Uh, and that's what, when you start putting money down, you realize, okay, I have to make choices. And how do I make those choices? And right. how you make those choices will have a direct impact on what population you target, who's going to be in your audience. And, and, and not and you put your money in different ways. It might be in targeting the population, but you might you might, for example, just for argument's sake, say, um, I want to target the Hispanic population by hiring more Spanish speaking speaking people. Yep. So, so you literally may not did that. have any more ads. Literally did that in my Indeed ad. Right. I need bilingual. Yeah. Right. Like if you're not bilingual, well, you're still being considered. But it's really we prefer at this hire bilingual. Yeah candidate not touching that one from a legal perspective just to be clear i'm sure there's like somebody that said that's wrong but that's what we put like bilingual preferred right so but i think but i think where you put your money where you put your dollars is going to have a dramatic impact on what diversity looks like as we continue and and the question of what is diversity will be answered not just in the diversity plans that sponsors will create, but in, in the individual choices that sites make. So sites have a huge role to play in the context of clinical research and diversity as we move forward. And it's going to uh, sponsors will will obviously have context and choice, but the actual day to day decisions will be based uh, based on sites like Yuma clinical trials. I hope so, man. I think we need more sites in underserved communities. I think that long tail is going to get longer and it's counterintuitive counter counter to big pharma strategy of let's everything efficient, centralized. No, it's going to get messy. If you want diversity, it's going to get messy. I mean, technically Netflix did a good job with that, right? I mean, Netflix made an entire business model out of just the long tail. Every revolutionary technology does that yeah. standard oil did that why because kerosene before was not standardized you didn't know what you're getting oh, and they standardized that was that. A long tail. yeah that's how they started that's why they're named standard oil and then the pharma companies so squib started out because they were making um coloring for fabrics okay because prior to like chemical synthesis of like colors of dyes you had to actually find like plants with those colors. That's why purple was like only for royalty because it was very rare to find purple. You had to go to like yeah. a sea urchin or something. Yeah. So then Squib came out as a dye company and said, "Hey, how can we bring like chemical synthesis to these drugs?" And then that's where they came out with like making. Uh, I think it was ether for anesthesia. Like, how do we standardize this? And that was the long tail that that became pharma. So everything, like this diversity is going to be the same thing. Like it's going to get messy. There's going to be a group there. Why, why are so many venture capital companies looking at sites like Yuma Clinical Trials to acquire, put into a group and say, hey, pharma, 
we have sites all across the border and in all these minority communities. I think use us for your next study. Let's let's have a whole conversation that's separate on a different day on just M and A in clinical trials. Oh man, yeah, that's a whole another topic. But yeah. you're right, man. It's always good to have these conversations because these are like what they should have discussed at that investigator meeting. And more people would have stayed instead of like going to the bathroom or making phone calls. Well, I'm I'm glad we actually had this conversation. I do need to go go out soon, but it, yes. it's one of those conversations that honestly we, we got more into the the dirt and sort of got our hands dirty with what what does that mean? What do, what does diversity mean? We need um, to. This is not a clean topic. This is a messy topic. This is a messy topic. Um, but I want to appreciate I want to appreciate Kevin for contributing as much. Well, as then you're the man, right? Like we got to get you on the podcast. <laughs> and then you, Uma, you too, please, please, I'm going to message you right now. Darshan, anything you'd like to say to wrap up? Fraud Pod, uh, you, oh. you're, you're a hardworking man. Well, join me on Darshan Talks, which is my podcast. I talk about law and compliance in uh, clinical research, but also all things pharma and FDA regulated companies. And um, if you need legal help, you can always find me on um, at Cl- the Kulkarni Law Firm, and I do work in just FDA-regulated industries. And um, hopefully, I'm going to get a chance to talk to Dan more because we're going to be, um, we're hopefully going to have another one on Fraud Pod, which Fraud is over here. What's another juicy one, man? Let's we'll find Dude, something. So much Industry will give us. It's the gift <laughs> that keeps on giving. They will give us something from above. <laughs> There's always. I have so many topics. We. I'm not even worried. We'll have that discussion. Okay. Well, thank you. Everybody go follow Darshan. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Go hit him up right now. Catch y'all later. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.